Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are Michael Thompson and Roger White. Michael has been with Sterling Talent Solutions for three years. As a Director of Sales, Michael is here to help clients mitigate applicant and employee risk with fully compliant practices throughout a comprehensive suite of products and services. Michael has proven to be an expert in the staffing industry during his time with Sterling, personally partnering with many of the local chapters of the ASA as an expert in the background screening and drug testing. Roger has been with Sterling Talent Solutions for six years. During his tenure, he has focused primarily on helping clients address their individual hiring process and find ways to increase efficiency, ensure compliance, and to create and promote a differentiated candidate experience, which ultimately leads to cost savings, time savings, and a more engaged and long-term employees for his clients and partners. Sterling Talent Solutions provides hiring peace of mind by delivering a simpler, smarter background screening and onboarding experience for employers worldwide. Our comprehensive suite of cloud-based background screening and onboarding solutions delivers accurate, reliable results and tools to maintain compliance throughout the hiring cycle. The background screening industry is ever-evolving thanks to emerging technologies. Companies are beginning to recognize and take advantage of the benefits of streamlining their hiring process from background screening to I-9 to specialized onboarding documents. Knowing your candidate's expectations and how to meet them is critical to your organization's success when competing for top talent. In today's edition of the Industry Insider Webinar Series, we'll cover mitigating risk with effective background screening, reducing risk with the use of electronic I-9 and E-Verify, how to create an exceptional candidate experience with electronic onboarding, and creating a one-source solution for your background screening and onboarding program. By the end of this session, you'll know how to deliver a simpler, smarter background screening and onboarding experience for your employees worldwide. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming Michael and Roger. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, Amanda. Uh, Roger and I, this is Michael Thompson. Roger and I truly appreciate the, uh, the, the intro. We're excited to be here and excited to chat with, uh, with all the attendees online. Um, as Amanda mentioned, uh, our goal today is to, to, to go ahead and chat a bit about background screening and onboarding. Um, some of the advantages that our clients have been able to take uh, in creating what we call a sole source solution. Uh, being able to work with your applicant tracking systems, your HRIS systems, your HRMS systems in streamlining your process from an applicant uh, coming on board all the way through to having them as an employee through your payroll and benefits. So I want to make sure I remind everyone, please do not be afraid to ask a question. As Amanda mentioned, we're going to have some time at the end for some Q&A. Uh, do not hesitate to send any questions in on the content that's shared or any related topics. Uh, please continue to join the conversation by following us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, Roger and I personally are consistently sharing information, uh, not so much specifically to background screening, but it's, it's the entire hiring process, right? It's everything that everyone's dealing with day to day, uh, any information that we are, are coming in contact with. And feel free to contact us personally. Uh, Roger and I are both going to have our information shared here shortly. Uh, everyone can go ahead and reach out to us um, you know, through, through our direct line uh, or via email or on LinkedIn as well. And feel free to download some resources. Uh, I know that through Tricom we're going to get an opportunity to share some clickable content. Uh, please feel free to visit our website. We uh, have a webinar series of our own so that people can go ahead and 
make sure you're staying abreast, uh, similar to the insider that that Tricom hosts. We want to make sure that everyone is just up to date and up to speed with everything going on in the industry. I wanted to give a quick recap of Sterling back, uh, Sterling uh, Talent Solutions, a quick introduction. Um, again, we are the world's largest background screening and uh, employment screening firm. Our company was established in 1975, uh, giving us you know over 40 years of experience and, and expertise in this industry. Uh, being a global organization spreading across nine countries with about 3,700 or more employees, we service uh, 50,000 plus clients, including 25% of the Fortune 100. With that volume of client, you know, with our large client base, we actually are processing more than 12 million candidates a year, uh, with more than 80 million individual components processed each year. And again, today's presenters, I think it's a good idea just to be able to put a face to the name. Um, again, myself, Michael Thompson, and uh, Roger, if you can just go ahead and say, say hello to, uh, to the attendees, that'd be great. Yeah, hello, everybody, and thanks for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you guys a little bit about what Michael just went through and uh, answer any questions that you guys might have along the way. So thanks, Michael. Thanks, bud. All right, and as uh, Amanda mentioned up front, we are going to be covering a few uh, really important topics here today, uh, being able to mitigate risk with an effective background screening program, reducing your risk with the use of electronic I-9 E-Verify, creating an exceptional candidate experience, uh, and all in all, we want to make sure that the, the attendees today uh, learn how to leverage technology in order to streamline their background screening program, drug testing program, I-9 E-Verify, onboarding, uh, et cetera. Everything that goes into your hiring process, uh, whether it's through us or another vendor, we want to make sure that you're, you're taking advantage of the opportunities that are given to you. So first and foremost, I think it's important to go ahead and chat about um, an effective background screening program. How can an effective background screening program help mitigate the risk that your company is subject to? I think most importantly to, to, to chat about this topic is understanding the roadblocks that there are to a successful hiring process. You see a bunch of numbers on the board. Uh, those numbers uh, represent some of the roadblocks within this industry. 92 million Americans have a criminal record. That's more than one out of four people that are applying for jobs within your business. Globally, fraud costs companies over $3.5 trillion each year. In the U.S. alone, almost half of those companies have been victims of fraud. Now, that's 45% of the companies that have actually discovered fraud. Um, I can only imagine what the number would be of companies that haven't found it yet. More importantly, one, uh, that's the purpose of the meeting today, is to give you an idea of how to create one streamlined solution to allow you to mitigate the risk of incurring some of these different challenges as well. Now, in regards, to, in regards to an effective screening program, um, the best option here is, is, of course, to avoid hiring criminals, avoid hiring fraudsters and, and cheats, not hiring them in the first place. Uh, the problem is it's, it's very hard to get a complete picture of your candidate. Um, screening programs tend to be extremely cumbersome, uh, tend to be complicated. Uh, there are multiple different regulations that are constantly changing, whether it's specific uh, local reg reg um, regulations and, and restrictions based on different counties and states, and if you have an, a global program, different countries. Um, and all in all, uh, in effect, a negative uh, impact that it could possibly have on your brand. Right? One of the things we want to talk about today is your candidate experience and brand recognition. It's in, uh, extremely important, especially with the way that social media allows candidates to communicate today to make sure that we're giving the best overall impression of your organization from the second they apply for your company all the way in through their first and second days uh, with the organization. Background screening is an industry uh, which I, I get excited to chat about because it is one that is often commoditized. Um, when you're thinking of an effective background screening program, it's, it's often thought of, you know, a background screen is a background screen, uh, which typically is not true. Uh, it depends on how the vendor that you're working with is validating and scrubbing that information, reporting it back to you, again, com you know, following the right compliance functionalities. So first, let's start off with some stats here. 80% um, of crimes typically happen in a candidate's backyard. Those are the counties that the candidate actually lives in. 
that's leaving about 20% of those crimes to have happened in counties where they have not had a residence, maybe where they've worked, where they vacationed, could be the, the county, you know, five minutes down the road. It gives a, a bit of a, a new meaning to what happens in Vegas, right? It's also, you know, letting us know that one in five crimes can potentially be overlooked by the traditional criminal background screen. I think most importantly, we want to, you know, as a background screening vendor uh, and being transparent with our partners and, and clients that we work with, is to make sure everyone understands that there is no perfect background screen. Any vendor that you work with that tells you that there is, is lying to you. Uh, run away as fast as you can. Now, there are ways to improve your chances of getting the complete candidate picture. Um, first, let's start by talking about the status quo of the industry. Uh, your screening program that you're using with your vendor should typically start off with the Social Security trace. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with what an SSN trace is, it's the ability for your vendor to go ahead and find everywhere that your applicant has lived, as well as any additional names that your applicant has. Uh, typically in this industry, the, the, the status quo, again, is going back about seven to ten years. Uh, and, and as previously mentioned on the last slide, it's imperative uh, as 80 percent of crimes happen in those specific counties. Now, I'm sure you're all thinking what happens in the counties outside of where they live? Uh, what services do background screening companies offer in order to find those counties as well? So the nationwide database, the Enhanced National Criminal Database, is a host of public records. It's a repository that most vendors in the industry will use in order to find and locate criminal records. Uh, it is a great locator, <clears throat> but should never be used as a standalone criminal search. Uh, this is one of the things that I see typically when I'm, I'm working with partners of mine that um, are, are coming from other vendors or you know coming to Sterling and, and trying to get a best practice recommendation. The industry has really uh, depicted this, this national criminal database as a single criminal search, one that gives you a full criminal aspect, a view of the entire country, uh, when in reality it's not true. This database is a good locator tool. Is it's uh, a wide net that they cast across the country, but there are pockets within it. Uh, it's name match only, typically mostly felony only, uh, and there are certain counties and states that don't report into it at all. So as I'm sure most of the attendees are on the phone, um, there are areas in the country where you may have a location that the state does not report up into the nationwide database. So you have all of your candidates that you're screening for, you're running this product and, and paying for a product that you're, you're screening these applicants when the, the, the likeliness of the, of the crimes that they may have committed in the county next door to where they live isn't going to be you know, housed within that nationwide database. Now, when you look at the social and, and the nationwide database put together, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the locators uh, are essentially useless without county validation. So being focused on, on compliance uh, with Sterling Talent Solutions, one of the things that, that I always focus on and I, I urge my partners to think about whether, you know, regardless of who they're using, is, is how are these, these, these searches being validated? How is the information being scrubbed and, and submitted uh, back to you as the client in order for you to make a hiring decision? The locators are there to identify the counties, identify the states where your applicant has committed a crime. It's then your vendor's responsibility to go ahead and open up a county court search, open up a state search, go to the source and validate that those crimes were at, not only actually happened, that they are reportable and usable in a legal hiring decision, uh, and more importantly, that they're the right candidate. Um, you know, an applicant with the name of Michael Thompson, it's quite a common name, there could be multiple Michael Thompsons. You know, going ahead and scrubbing against the different, you know, additional identifiers, whether it's a middle name, a birth date, social security number, those are the things that, that your vendor needs to do, which, like I mentioned in the beginning of the meeting, is the things that separate one vendor from another, uh, that creates, you know, the, that, that really takes this industry out of being, you know, commoditized and allow it to, to differentiate. So these are the questions you want to make sure you're asking your vendor. How are they filling the gaps left behind by the nationwide database? How are they scrubbing the data before presenting it to you? Um, do they fully understand the differences in regulations and restrictions from, from state to state uh, and country to country if you're working with a global program? Secondly, uh, you know, as you can imagine, you think about your current program that you have in place today. Uh, you go ahead and screen an applicant you decide that you want to bring them on board, one of the next steps is your I-9E verify process. 
keeping along with the theme of the meeting today, we want everyone to be aware of the ways that an electronic I-9 uh, e-verify process can go ahead and improve your, uh, not only your candidate experience, but really mitigate your risk. So Form I-9 seems pretty simple. Uh, it's just two pages of paper, that's all. Uh, but it is can be or really can be a minefield for companies as, as one mistake, one typo uh, can be a fine of, of $100 all the way up to $1,100. Uh, filling your cabinets full of old paper I-9s, those typically can put you at risk as well. Uh, audits have jumped up 1,200 percent in the last five years. Uh, fines are up to 1,980 percent. And in some of the most outrageous case, uh, cases, th there can be criminal arrests. Some of the more common Form I-9 mistakes uh, is really driven by the lack of expertise in understanding a complex program. Failing to completely comprehend and retain all the information, it's a, it can be a, a complex Form I-9 handbook that you're reading through, 70 pages or so, uh, leaves a ton of room for administrative errors in those Form I-9s. Uh, the timing, the failure to complete and file these things on time, um, employers can't afford to fall behind in, in completing I-9s and, and then getting them filed. Section 1 has to be completed within that first business day and then the first day of work for pay. Uh, and then Section 2, again, within the first three days, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The failure to review and, and validate employees' Section 2 documents in person. For my nines require an in-person review. We want to make sure that uh, there is somebody on site with that applicant reviewing the employee verification documents. Uh, this poses a challenge for remote hires where, where companies don't have an agent or a physical presence. We're taking paper forms, we're scanning them, we're sending PDFs, uh, often not the best process you can imagine. There is typically room for invalid or missing data when things are being filed on paper. It's easy for employees or even the HR administrators or, uh, to miss or fill forms in, uh, incorrectly. Some of the common forms or common mistakes that we typically see in, in, that, in that area are um, whether it's a missing signature, could be spelling errors, or incorrect dates. And lastly, misinforming the employee uh, regarding what documentation is needed to produce. So telling the, the employee what's, what needs to be produced is extremely important. Uh, they need to provide either one of the acceptable list A documents, uh, one of the acceptable list B or list C documents, employers who specify that the documents that the employee should provide, uh, making sure that they, you know, let them know that it violates the anti-discrimination provisions, uh, some of the Immigration Nationality Acts, keeping your applicants uh, or, or soon to be employees up to date on how the, on how the I-9 industry works uh, or I-9, you know, piece of the business works is important. So I have the, the comprehensive I-9 slide here and, and I want to make sure that everyone takes this slide for what it is. And there's going to be a few slides here that Roger and I chat a bit about what we do. Again, that's our experience in the industry. Um, but the important thing to take from these slides is not what Sterling does. It's what you should be doing. It's the questions to ask your vendor, whether it's I-9 through your background screening vendor or it's through a standalone vendor. Um, it's an electronic process through your applicant tracking system or even your onboarding process. Uh, regardless of who you're working with, these are the questions and, and some of the things that you need to make sure that you're, you're requesting from them and you're asking them and you're uh, working into your process as you onboard your applicants. So, Roger, if I can ask you to jump in and chat some about the comprehensive I-9 services that, we, that, that you typically see in the industry yeah. and from your yeah. experience and how the electronic process can help. Absolutely, Michael, and thank you. Yeah, so I was really thinking about this and working with, you know, Department of Homeland Security for the past decade. and. We've seen a, a paradigm shift in the way that I-9s have been handled and, you know, really thinking about if we were to rewind the clock a decade ago, nobody was really doing it electronically due to the fact of it is so compliant and it's required to have this be a very compliant process. And what we see with organizations is that you usually have one or two or three or five people that are specialists when it comes to I-9. So you go to them and they have the answers because there's a lot of questions that come along, whether it be, you know, how do I do a memo on the I-9 or, 
you know, what do I do if I can't read the identification document? But in most organizations, particularly in the staffing industry, there's a lot of verifiers. And so you'll have multiple individuals that are responsible for helping do Section 2, to, to Michael's point, on maybe remote employees. And so what, I've, what we've done is really worked directly with Department of Homeland Security, and we've seen a shift in really, instead of it being a, an exception, it's becoming more of the rule with, with electronic processes around this because it allows companies to have that compliance built in. So to Michael's point earlier about having the fields filled out correctly and not a little spelling error or a zip code mismatch, um, things like that can lead to very large fines. And so what you want to look for when looking at an I-9 solution is is that compliance built in so that regardless of who does it, it could be somebody you hired a week ago to do an I-9 for a new employee, is the system built in such a way that they can verify Section 2 and make sure that it's fully compliant for your organization? And that's really what we strive for and what I-9 services in the industry today strive for. And, and working so closely with DHS, we find that there's things that need to happen in order to make sure that you're compliant. And so that's what we built in. I'm not going to bore you guys with the details of the logs with date and time stamps to the second, but know that there are solutions out there that ensure your compliance when it comes to the I-9 and that, you know, the future of this is really being able to give your candidate the experience of doing this on their mobile device or at home on their computer, and then the verifier being able to meet with that person face-to-face -to, -face to identify the document and be able to log that information in a compliant fashion. So that way you're not uh, relative to any sort of fines if you were to go through an audit. So this is something uh, uh, Sterling Talent Solutions has worked diligently on, and I know that a lot of my other partners that do I-9 services across the United States, um, this has come a long way in the last few years, and it's a very exciting time. So um, I would definitely implore you to dig in deeper with this. Um, but having a solution that ensures that everybody who is part of that process is compliant is really, really important, um, particularly with organizations such as yours. So. Excellent. So I'm going to actually trans, uh, transition right into the technology side because we're talking about technology with I-9 and how that translates into technology within the hiring process. So um, talking a little bit about, again, I'm going to reiterate what Michael had mentioned about, you know, Today, it's about really thinking about what's best for your organization, right? And being that Michael and I have been in this industry for as long as we have, we see different companies doing things different ways. And so my hope is today to give you even a piece or two of information that you can take back with you and possibly enhance your hiring program to create a more efficient process for your individuals, a more compliant program for your organization, and really create a robust candidate experience that everybody is always looking for, especially in today's day and age um, in the technology world that we live in. So one of the, some of the things that we focus on here is creating a candidate portal that's specific to your company, having the functionality to create workflows that are specific to positions, which may include background screening, I-9, et cetera, and being able to report on that information and have documents management. So on this next slide here, we kind of go talk a little bit about what that hiring process might look like, and we really focus on you know, the offer stage, so when you identify a candidate you want to move forward with, how you handle getting their information, and how you handle giving them the offer letter to work at your organization. And then upon that, being able to screen that candidate. And that could be very different for different organizations. For your particular organization, you may work with multiple different companies that have very different uh, uh, regulations with regards to how they need to screen. And so really focusing on finding a company or a, a third party or a vendor that is able to accommodate those different uh, variances for you is very important. And then finally, once you have gone through that kind of screening and offer, being able to onboard them in an efficient manner, right? The last thing that we want to do is create a, uh, a world where um, you know, there's so much paper involved and that individual comes on board and they're spending day one in a room writing their address on 30 pieces of paper. It's not the candidate experience we're looking for. So I'm going to dig a bit more into that here in a few. So where does that fit in? So just kind of stepping back and taking a 30,000 foot overview. When you think about the employment life cycle, you're thinking about recruiting and sourcing your candidates, screening and onboarding them, 
and then managing them right after day one. And so I really think about it in those three buckets. And what we've really tried to focus on and something I'd implore you to think about is that, you know, after you source and recruit those candidates through your talent acquisition software or applicant tracking system, or maybe you just do it internally, which is great as well, you know, how do you go through that a compliance screening and onboarding process in order to set them up so that day one and beyond is very manageable and organized. And that's what we have focused on here um, at Sterling Talent Solutions is automating that process. And really um, what I'm gonna talk about here in a second is integrating to that front end, right? So yes, it's important to be able to communicate with the, the, the management of hires after they're hired, but really communicating with your recruiting software in order to ensure efficiency for your teams is big, especially when you're talking about, you know, having to do multiple requisitions in a given day, being able to launch that or manipulate that through your ATS is very important as well. And when I talk about that on this next slide here, you get a quick under, just a quick look at some of our partner integration ecosystems. So these are um, just kind of off the top some of the different applicant tracking systems that we directly integrate with. And most of these on this list are in fact just part of our normal uh, standard integration. So we have built an API integration with these companies so that when you are set up, you actually are able to just turn that on. And so again, I, I want you to think about your hiring process and not specifically about Michael and I. Yes, we work at Sterling Talent Solutions, so we know our business, but for you, it's more important for you to think about you know, how is my recruiting software communicating with my screening and onboarding provider? How is that making my team better? And how is that creating compliance for my organization? And then finally, very important again, how is that look to my candidate? Is my candidate going through a process that makes it very easy? And so being able to integrate, as you see on this slide, from the ATS right into our platform and back into the ATS is very important. So when looking at a, a partner for your screening and onboarding, really think about, you know, what am I doing to recruit and source candidates and can that communicate through technology with my uh, screening and onboarding provider? And that leads to what I actually enjoy the most about my job, and that is just continuing to raise the bar with the candidate experience. In, in today's day and age, um, in the hiring and seeking of whether it be millennials or whatever the case may be, you know, in today's technology world, it is very important to create a candidate experience that is differentiated from anybody else in order to position yourself to retain and keep the top talent. And so I think that that's really import, important be, and for a variety of reasons, and I'm sure everybody on the call today can think about times when maybe not the best candidate experience led to something that you didn't want, right? Maybe that person turned over faster than you had wanted to, or perhaps uh, it took too long from a time to hire perspective and they moved on to another opportunity. But if you really focus on that and involve the right individuals within your organization, that's going to be really important to help drive referrals to your company, protect your brand, reduce the cost of a poor hiring decision so that you're vetting that individual appropriately, as Michael was talking about earlier, improving your time to hire because it's a competitive environment. And so if you have to take way longer than the next company, you may miss out on really important talent uh, by going that route and also making sure that it is improving the quality of your hire. And so, you know, really, is that important? It, it, it is. And so every company looks at that a little bit differently. And so some companies, it's more important to others. Um, but really, you know, thinking about how can you do that? How can you protect your brand through the candidate experience? It's about streamlining your applicant process, really making it so where the applicant, they don't know anything about this. They may be confused and sending them a bunch of different systems to have to work through can be monotonous. So really streamlining that for your applicant is going to create a great hiring experience and then shortening that hiring cycle. So instead of, you know, going through a long process with the background check and perhaps drug screening into, you know, filling out the I-9 in person and then maybe having to come back on day one and sit in a room and write their name on 30 pieces of paper, having the ability to do everything I just mentioned directly on a mobile device or from their home computer. And then being consistent so that all candidates are receiving the same kind of communication and we can go into that a little bit more as well. And uh, I see some questions that have popped up around this too, so we'll be, we'll be sure to address this here towards the end. And then sharing content. So, you know, the applicants as they're kind of determining where they're going to go, 
you know, having that same content resonate across all everybody, it really instills that culture. And I'm sure everybody can attest to how important that is, particularly in that first 30, 60, 90 days and making sure that everybody has the information that they need, that it's branded and that it's very clear and concise. And so when you think about that, when you think about, okay, all those forms that they fill out, those can be very specific company forms, specific to your client or to your particular organization. But I also want to make sure, and I want to bring this up just to kind of level set everybody, is you want to be thinking about corporate forms that are specific and also government forms. Okay, so things like W-4, W-9, state tax withholding forms, et cetera. Very, very important to be thinking about all of those and then having uh, the ability, if you're going in an automated fashion with your new hire forms, to be able to take your company custom forms, maybe it's a very specific form to a particular organization that you staff for, and be able to take that and bring it into a web-based software so that the candidate can electronically sign that form right next to their W-4 or Form 8850. And that's the that's the kind of the the future state of you know, streamlining the hiring process and something that we take a lot of pride in getting in front of. And in, with all the staffing firms that I work with and many other industries as well, the companies that are forward thinking in this area are retaining their new employees. They are creating a better experience and they have a better culture right out of the gate. So something to really think about and giving your hires that great experience uh, right up front. Great. Well, Roger, I appreciate you jumping in there and talking a bit more about technology. Um, hopefully, the information that was shared today uh, was, was at least a, a catalyst, uh, a catalyst for, for forward thinking and a catalyst for thought. I want um, all of the members and the attendees on the, on the call today to, to really think about the things that we chatted about. And we talked very high level about a lot of different topics, um, getting into the details of background screening and onboarding and drug testing and I-9s can take hours. Um, and we're glad to have those conversations, and I'm sure your vendor's glad to have those conversations. Um, the, the idea was just to get the, the creative juices flowing and, and, and get everyone at least an idea of what other people in the industry are doing, where the experts, um, you know, like Roger and I, people that have been doing this for a long time, where we see the industry going. Um, getting things into an electronic, you know, platform, um, as Roger mentioned, especially with the, with the emergence of, of millennials in the industry, uh, it has become extremely important. I also want to just you know, inform everybody, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, stay informed. Uh, there's nothing more important as you're, you're, you're working in this ever-changing industry, uh, especially the staffing industry, whether it's regulations on your end um, or regulations on ours, right? You, there, there's things with the specific things that you all have to go through as a staffing firm specifically. Um, you shouldn't have to worry about what the background screening industry is doing as well. Uh, work with a work with a partner. Find a partner that you feel confident with and, and that you trust to go ahead and share this kind of content. Keep you up to date, but make sure that they're being you know keep, keeping themselves up to date as well. So I wanted to um, go ahead and open the floor um, for some questions. Amanda, I'm not sure if you wanted to jump back in and uh, go ahead and, and guide that conversation. Right. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them using the chat or the Q&A feature. I'll also open up a poll so you can give us some feedback today. Uh, as questions are coming in, um, can you tell me if there are any specific or some of the frequent questions that you may receive um, as you're dealing with staffing clients who are um, looking at background providers? or some of the, the biggest things that they should really uh, be checking into? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Amanda mentioned in the beginning of the, of the meeting, as she introduced Roger and I, staffing is an industry that I do focus on here in the background screening realm. Um, knowing and understanding the challenges that you all go through is extremely important. So two of the things that I've noticed um, that are common themes that come back from my staffing clients are uh, first and foremost is time to hire, right? If the background screen is taking a week long uh, and you need the applicant on site, you know, three days ago, uh, that can create some frustration for you, uh, could potentially risk your relationship with your client, um, as well as margins, making sure that the, <clears throat> the money that you're spending and investing into a background screen program is not only going to protect your business, but it's not going to squeeze the margins down to where the business is not valuable anymore. 
so, so the questions that that I am, am typically asked, and I and I actually ask to my to my uh, partners is, what are the turnaround times looking like? What are you experiencing with your vendors today? Right? Are you are you are you working with a program that's that's taking so long that you can't get an applicant place at a client uh, on time and effectively? And what type of costs are you seeing? And costs aren't necessarily generated by strictly a background screen costs thirty dollars or twenty dollars or ten dollars. It's what type of access fees are being passed along? Are they charging you per county that you're accessing? What jurisdictions are you screening in? Would it make more sense to go, you know, run a state search versus a county search? Um, it, it, it takes, as far as specific questions, if you have a concern, my suggestion is just ask it to your vendor or ask it to Roger and I today. There's typically a way to go ahead and, and, and maneuver your process or create the process in a way that allows you to get the most out of it, whether it's running a single county search or an unlimited county search, depending on if you need quick turnaround times using a vendor that has some electronic integrations and ways to get that information back a bit quicker uh, are definitely two of the topics that I hear uh, most often is your time to hire and your margins. And to that end, Michael, if I can add to that, one of the things that I've seen with many of my staffing uh, clients that I've been working with now for years is really uh, t asking the questions around how, what kind of specialists do they have internally, right? So when you're working with a vendor, are you going to be working with people on a day-to-day -day or asking questions of a client services team that is understands the staffing industry? Because as you know, it's very different and unique compared to every other industry out there. And so what we found is one of the big things that have really helped us a lot in these last few years is creating um, what we call pod structure around having the support structure structure and everybody involved with your account or the, the staffing company's account knowing the staffing industry. So when those questions come up, it may not be the answer that you would want to give to a bank or a hospital, but instead very specific to you because they understand what you're looking to accomplish. It may be very different for you, to Michael's point, from a time to hire perspective than it would for a hospital or a bank or a municipality. But for, for your particular industry, those types of things are very important. And you know branding is very important and recognition and those types of things. So having a support structure around that that understand your industry is another thing that I would say would be something to look for when determining who the right partner would be um, in this particular area. So I just wanted to throw that in there as well. All right. There, there's, no industry that, there's no industry that we deal with from the background screening standpoint um, that we are more closely tied than a staffing company. Your yep. revenue, um, your business, your relationships are driven by your background screen vendor doing their job uh, and doing it well. So uh, it, it's an extremely important partnership, which is why I like to urge everyone to not think of it as, as a commodity uh, and ask those, those tough questions of your vendor and see what responses come back. Yeah, and I just saw a question come through, Michael, that's actually right along the same line. So we'll take this one first, and then we'll hit those other ones. But um, somebody on the on the uh, on the attendee list asked Ed, that as a staffing company, they push to ensure that they're branding appropriately with all their different clients, and trying to set that candidate experience through that client can be tough. And so that's actually something that we've heard loud and clear. So you have 50 different clients that you staff for. Um, when you go to get a new candidate, are they seeing your name, or are they seeing that candidate or the client that? you are staffing for. And in the old days, that's the, all we could really do was help the staffing firm. But what we've done is we've developed, and I know a lot of other companies in the space have developed software around being able to make that very personal. So for instance, one of my clients has 50 plus different clients that they work with. And so they have 50 plus different portals and email templates that they can change at the drop of a dime themselves in our software so that when the candidate gets the correspondence from them for whether it be screening or onboarding or I-9, that information is branded with the client that you're staffing for. And that has been huge. Just being able to, it seems so simple, but just being able to create that experience so that candidate, you know, is, feels like they're working with that client. Um, some of my staffing agencies decide not to do that, but most of them do. And that's something that we have been able to accommodate. And it's just built in out of our platform. And again, uh, you know, the software is ours. A lot of companies are similar to that. And again, I just want to give you all tidbits to think about as, as you're looking at providers here, but that is something that uh, is very important in today's day and age is making sure you're able to brand the portal and the emails um, with your clients to really promote that brand. So I wanted to kind of push ahead and answer that question real quick before we got to everything else. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I have a question that's come in in reference to E-Verify. 
Um, can you explain a little bit about um, E-Verify and uh, how it, it is not a replacement for I-9 and um, where E-Verify might be mandated um, versus where it is not? You bet, absolutely. And if you don't mind, Michael, I'll take this one as well since I'm in it every day. Um, so yeah, the E-Verify, yeah, E-Verify is actually pretty exciting for us because to me, when you know, when E-Verify came about, it was you know this big database that basically tells you whether or not somebody is um, authorized to work or tentative non-confirmation, in which case more work needs to be done. So in, in a nutshell, and most of you probably know this, E-Verify is a database that you can go online and run your candidate through after you get the I-9 for free and get the result back as to whether or not they're able to work in the U.S. Mandated in some states, required for federal jobs in some states, but not for municipality jobs, and then not quite there in other states. But, you know, as you probably can see, slowly but surely, it's slowly starting to be mandated in more and more states. So what I see is a lot of my clients that are maybe in a state where it's not mandated, having that within their solution anyway, because they're getting in front of it. Why not, right? Just make sure that that individual is uh, authorized to work in the U.S. And so one of the ways that we handle that that I know is a bit unique, and so another question to ask if you're looking at a, a partner in this area, is integrating with E-Verify. And yes, you can go on to E-Verify and do it yourself and be your own agent and sign the memorandum of understanding in order to do that. But what we've done for our clients is automating that I-9 process is integrating directly with E-Verify. So as soon as that process is done and they submit section two, the picture of the individual pops up on the screen. You say, yes, this is the person sitting in front of me directly through the integration. And it immediately within five to 10 seconds gives you a tentative non-confirmation and authorization to work or whatever the case may be. And being a designated agent for your organization means that we will be there to walk you through the process needed after that. So if it is a tentative non-confirmation, we are your designated agent to ensure that you're compliant in walking through those necessary steps. So yes, it's a big, big area of focus in the industry, not required everywhere, but in a lot of places it is. And again, a lot of companies are wanting to get in front of that. So again, having that integration along with the uh, electronic process of I-9 is something that would be of a huge value for any organization that does um, quite a few different I-9s with E-Verify. So hopefully that answers the question. If there's any more elaboration that you need, please go ahead and send it through, and I'm happy to. Wonderful. Is there a database um, or somewhere either on your website that um, shows where the states have mandated it versus states that have not yet? Yeah, you know, and it's something that I actually look up quite a bit. In fact, I think if you literally just Google E-Verify map, it, the first link that comes up, I'm pretty sure, will say maps of states with mandatory E-Verify laws, and there's also an E-Verify overview from USCIS, mm -hmm. and you can literally find a picture of the U.S. with the, the states that require all employers, the states that require just state agencies, the states that require uh, just contractors, the states where there's legislation pending. And again, that's changing all the time. So who knows what tomorrow brings for a certain state, but that's a good area. The other place that I would implore people to go to is I-9 Central, okay? I-9 Central, if you simply Google I-9 Central, it will take you to the USCIS a website where there is so many resources available to you with regards to I-9 and E-Verify, chances are you'll be able to find your question. And my favorite part about that is there's a phone number there. And if you call in either as an employer or an applicant, you will get a live person on the phone to ask your question to. It's been extremely helpful for my sales team here within the organization. And I would implore you to check that out as well, because there's a lot of great information in there around both I-9 and E-Verify. And E-Verify is an all-or-nothing type of process, too. Is that correct? Um, for that is correct. For discriminatory reasons, that if you're going yep, to do it, exactly. you have to do it for all? Yep, exactly. Very good point. I'm glad that you brought that up. So, yeah, so that you either don't do it or you do do it, depending upon your requirements within states. And once you decide to do it on your employees, you have to do it from that day forward, and it has to be done within three business days of date of hire. And so it's very important that you have a very clear, concise, it's almost like taking a copy of the ID card on your I-9, right? 
Um, DHS says you either do it on everybody or you don't do it on anybody, but nowhere in between. You can't just take copies of the passport for certain individuals. Do it on everybody or not. And the day that you implement it from that day forward, you need to be doing it on everybody. And the same holds true for E-Verify as well. Um, once you decide to do it, you have to do it. And you can make the decision to take that away and not do it any longer if you're not required by law. But from that day forward, you can't pick and choose who you do it on. So yeah, it's very much a compliant process within your organization to make that determination. Sure, and let's say you go into a state that is requiring it where you previously weren't in that state before. Does that now mean you would have to do it for everyone, including those in the state that you weren't previously required to? Very slippery slope, very slippery slope. And as you can imagine, we handle, we have to deal with that a lot. So um, it just, it depends also on, you know, where you are actually located from a business standpoint. Where do you have brick and mortar? Um, there, there's, it's, it's, it's not so much a gray area as much as it's kind of a slippery slope and who you need to screen. Now, if you were to go through an audit and let's say that you are doing, Let's say you're in, let's see, what's one here? Let's say this, the state of Florida, where state agencies and contractors need to be screened for E-Verify, or California, where you limit. So if you're in, operating in both of those two states, when you were, if you were to get audited, the employees that are out of California are going to be looked at a little bit differently than the other ones. So it's not a one-size-fits-all for everybody. To your point, it definitely is looked at individually if you're doing business in more than one state. Um, but I would implore you that if you're doing it in that state, that every employee in that state where it's required that you do it on everybody there. And the nice thing about our solution, because that is a little confusing, is that we will be able to break that out by individuals and in states where they work to ensure that we uh, make sure that you're compliant with the E-Verify. Wonderful. And again, you can you can see a lot of those answers on I-9 Central. It's a great resource. If you guys take away one thing from this today, um, that would be a great resource for you to get a lot of your questions answered as well. Okay. And on the I-9 side, uh, we get a lot of questions about I-9. I think that's probably one of the, the biggest concerns um, from a recruiter or staffing company um, to make sure that that process is correct. Um, and I think you had mentioned at one point, you know, having one or, you know, two or three people that are uh, managing that process so that it's always being done the same is a good idea. Do you have any other um, suggestions uh, for that process to help ensure that, that you're not leaving your company liable for risk? Yeah, and I'm, I'm a little bit partial because obviously I work at a company that automates the process electronically, but what I see is that Again, to your point, two or three or five or ten people may be just I-9 specialists. They've been in HR for years. They know how to do it. They know the latest regulations, but you have 50 people that do verifications of I-9. Having a solution that requires uh, smart validation within the field, within the government form I-9. So, for example, the city matches the zip code. The, the social security number is the right number of digits. The passport is either nine digits or a C followed by eight digits. These are things that companies that have people that may not be as up to speed on I-9 have trouble with with their I-9 process. But if you have an electronic process with smart validation, that's not something you necessarily have to worry about anymore because the I-9 cannot be completed unless it's done correctly. So to your point, I know there's a lot of concern around making sure that this is compliant. Well, having an electronic process and working with DHS as much as I have on this, it's, it's about ensuring that it's done correctly every time, right? And then along those same lines, you know, ensuring that you can put a memo on there. And we have a, the ability to put a memo on your I-9 just like you would if you were writing on a piece of paper. Um, another thing that doesn't go unforeseen, and I actually saw a question about this pop up in the list as well, is what if the identification document expires? Right, that's a big thing, right? If it's a, if, the, if you have a, a thousand I-9s in a filing cabinet, how do you know when that work visa that you've verified has an expiration in a year and a half unless you're using Outlook or somehow alerting yourself to go in and get that new I-9 or the new identification document? So having an electronic system allows alerts for that. And so when you verify that I-9 or when you input the old I-9 into an electronic system, it's going to log when that re-verification needs to occur and alert you so that you are compliant. So you can get ahead of it in a month or two before it expires because it's gonna alert you via email and on your dashboard. So just little examples of how companies that I've worked with will leverage technology in order to ensure compliance with I-9. 
um, you know, if they have, for instance, an ID document that they need to take a copy of. Well, you do have to do it on everybody. You know that. If you did it one, on one person, you have to do it on everybody. Well, what happens if you lose that copy? Now you're tracking it down. Well, having an electronic process to scan and attach it means it's electronically attached to that I-9 permanently. So if you were to get audited by ICE, not only do you have the I-9 and the ID document attached to each other electronically, but you also have your E-Verify case number along with the result all in one place with all of the log. And that's the other thing as well is a lot of times what I hear from companies with I-9 issues or that go through audits is there's questions around, you know, how was this verified? Did you actually meet the person face-to-face? -face? And I know that this is a big sticky area in the HR industry as a whole. And having, again, an electronic process that logs the clicks and the IP address for when those clicks happened and when the signature occurred takes that completely out of the mix. So when an auditor comes in and they see a log of every single date and timestamp to the second with an IP address associated with it of when it occurred, they are able to track that and know that it happened the right way and now you're passing your audit. So these are areas that companies that I work with that have gone through audits have passed, but not only that, but companies that have applied to do image, which maybe some of you know of, image is when you volunteer to be audited by ICE. And that's basically saying, hey, we think we got this perfect, but we may have some areas. Come audit us, ICE, and make sure that we're okay. And you're thinking, why would somebody want to do that? Well, a lot of these companies that really take it very seriously with the I-9 process and have thousands and thousands of I-9s that have used my, our system for that, they have done that. And that is something that we've learned a lot from as well. So these are just little tidbits that I want to share with you guys that hopefully get you thinking about it. Because again, that's mine and Michael's whole priority today is to get you thinking about things for your organization that can help you be more efficient, compliant, and create a better candidate experience. Absolutely. What if you were working with an applicant tracking software provider that wasn't listed on your screen slide earlier? Yeah, you bet. And that screen slide, again, is just a snapshot of our kind of the ones that we're able to do an API integration with. And for those of you that were where I was five years ago, I didn't even know what the heck an API was. Think about it like a layer on a piece of software in the cloud that other software providers can come plug into. And so those ones that you saw are ones that where we have that layer to be able to plug and play very easily. Now, we have many, many more recruiting software that we work with where it's not quite as easy to do an API integration, so we have to do some sort of a custom integration, whether that be a CSV batch integration through a secure FTP site, or perhaps a batch integration utilizing uh, internal technology in an organization. So the answer to your question is yes, there's many, many more. In fact, very rarely will I come across an applicant <laughs> tracking system that we haven't done some sort of a custom integration with at some point in time, even the newer ones. But what we do is we really look at um, you know being able to promote the ones where we're able to do the API. But yeah, the answer to your question is absolutely, regardless of your ATS, chances are we have either done one or we can c customize an integration um, with that particular organization. Wonderful. Have yeah. any other questions come in to you directly that I may have not seen? Looks like I have caught all of the ones that have come in through me. At this point, yeah. I, I just yeah. want to go ahead and put your contact information up in case anyone has any questions um, that they wanted to either reach out to you guys directly or myself. Um, the contact information is up on the screen. Um, before we close, do you have any other um, final comments that you wanted to share with the group today? Yeah, I can just go ahead and uh, chime in there. I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time. Um, I know that it was there was a lot of different stuff that we discussed today, a uh, multitude of different areas of this industry that are extremely important. Um, the, the, the main message to get out of this, uh, aside from Roger's great I-9 resources, are to make sure that we're focusing on asking the right questions. Talk to your vendor. Make sure you're, you're covering yourself and protecting yourself uh, from a risk mitigation standpoint, from background screening to I-9. Uh, one bad hire can ruin a brand that takes years to build. Uh, so an effective screening process and, and making sure that you're covering yourself from a, from a, from a fine standpoint, from, I -9, uh, from the I-9 areas, uh, are extremely important. So please feel free to reach out to us personally. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, you'll have Roger's, uh, Roger and I uh, have our direct lines there, our emails, uh, more than available to chat. 
and uh, continue to join these, these webinars and, and keep supporting TriCom. It's been a great partner to us, uh, and we're extremely excited to continue doing these. And if there's any topics, if we need more information on I-9 or whatever the case may be, let Amanda know. Uh, Roger and I would be glad to, to, to come back and make sure we share some more of our expertise with you all. Yeah, I echo that Great sentiment, comment. Michael and Amanda. Great. Thank you so much for having us and putting all this together. We appreciate it. And for all of you on the call, utilize us as resources, right? Yes, we're here to, to talk about our solution. That's great. But we understand the industry, and we're happy just to chat with you if you have questions. So to Michael's point, Absolutely. don't hesitate to reach out. We, uh, we love making new relationships and learning new ways that companies, particularly in the staffing industry, handle their, uh, their population groups. So um, we, we look forward to it as much as uh, you guys might want to reach out. To us. So thanks again, everybody. I appreciate the time. Thanks, everyone. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank our participants for uh, joining us on today's webinar and for both Michael and Roger for sharing their knowledge on background screening and onboarding and uh, the ability to create a one source solution. We will have the presentation available on our website under tricom.com under the resources and the industry insider webinar series tab. We will have the recording and I will uh, be able to send out the presentation slides, the PDF PowerPoint deck um, to those that were interested and have asked for it. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. <laughs>